Hello, everyone. Welcome to another Scrum Pulse. I'm Patricia Kong from scrum.org. And uh, there are many people registered today for today's topic on Scrum and OKRs, Objective Key Results. So what um, Ralph Yocum, a professional Scrum trainer, is going to be focused on, on today is talking about how OKRs can help increase the focus and transparency with Scrum. So he's got a lot of great content in there uh, focused around goals and measurements and all those different things and some probably some myths around OKRs. Um, some quick guidelines for us today is uh, for you all to be participating in this conversation. So um, put in your questions, I'll be monitoring those. My colleague, Lindsay, will be looking for your, your, your technical questions that she can help with. But um, if you have questions that are pertinent to, to some things that Ralph is gonna be talking about, feel free to, to chime in and I'll be monitoring those as we go along. The session is recorded. Um, so anything you want to go back and review, um, they'll be up for you on the scrum.org site. And again, please ask questions in the bottom right hand Q&A. Um, the chat will be nice for chatting, but the Q&A is where you want to get your questions in. All right. So quick, who is scrum.org? Scrum.org is us, um, co-founded by um, Ken Schwaber, who is the co-founder of Scrum, the Scrum framework. Um, and I think all I have to say today is that we're consistent, focused on consistency and we're a global community. So consistency in, um, in our courseware, our training, um, the education uh, for all the learners out there. Global community, you can see it today. We have Ralph Pukum, who is probably in Germany today, I think. Um, and then we have his partners, um, Agile Actors. And I think that that is George. You're in. Thank you. You're in Greece. Thank you, Patricia. Yes, <laughs> we are based in Athens, Greece. Uh, we are delighted to be uh, participating in today's uh, webinar. Uh, for those that. Uh, uh, you don't know us, Agile Actors is uh, an IT professional services and learning and development services uh, based in Greece. Um, we offer professional services around software development and we are members of the scrum.org professional training network since 2017. And uh, we have the privilege to be uh, running uh, scrum.org courses with uh, Ralph for the past four or five years uh, now. Um, Ralph, over to you. Thanks a lot, and I hope you all enjoy. Thank you. So um, that's me. Um, so um, I, I turned the Agile about 20 years ago, kind of a long time. Um, my, my background is, is programming, but you know, over the years, kind of, I transitioned on and, and moved on to, to different things. Um, I founded my own company, Effective Agile, 11 years ago. 10 years ago, sorry. I'm Since 11 years, I'm a trainer with Scrum.org. I'm Within the top tens, I've worked uh, extensively close with Ken uh, in the beginning, in the early days. I have global experience in the US, uh, Germany, um, the UK, uh, now Switzerland, where I'm living. Uh, I also wrote a book together with Don McGreal about product ownership. So that's also one of the topics which is really dear to my heart. And it's kind of probably also some of the topics which you can also see kind of uh, addressed in that talk. Yeah, I guess that's pretty much about myself. So uh, without any further ado, I'd like to jump into the talk. And again, if there are any questions, please uh, step in directly, uh, put it into the Q&A window, and then I'll, I'm happy to uh, answer them as they come up. And I think I'm going to sound like a broken record, but I'm there's this one thing which I'm seeing over and over again in all the organizations I help to transition to Agile or, or they're trying to, uh, the products they're trying to build. And for me, this is always the elephant in the room. It's always there, it's always present. Uh, many people see it, some people still don't see it, but that's the ongoing problem which we see in organizations when they want to build products in an Agile way, when they want to build products uh, with Scrum. Normally what I see, and this is what, what I refer to as the product management onion, is that usually any organization has a vision where they wanna go. And based on that, they derive the business strategy. Now within the context of Scrum, we are really good in solution and value discovery in regards to our customers. And then basically building it, delivery and validation. But in between there, there's this disconnect 
And how do we manage this disconnect? In a classical way, we have our milestones, we have charters, we have reports, we have plans, and usually plans are based on scope, time, and budget. And that's more like process compliance, project compliance. Yeah? We don't have a project owner in Scrum, we have a product owner in Scrum, and that's why this is this ongoing problem. We have to fill it, this vacuum, with a clear product vision and a strategy. And that's an ongoing other problem I see often is that basically this is how it shows is that we have a strategic clear understanding where we want to go as an organization, but we lack the capabilities on to bring it onto the ground, you know, hit the ground running essentially, that because of this disconnect. And this, in my opinion, is kind of the elephant in the room this disconnect about how can we act upon our strategies. I don't see companies who have bad strategies. I see companies that have good ideas, good strategies, but they fail on acting on, on those. And that's kind of what we, where I see a benefit in if you apply OKRs in that context. So let's first have a little bit of a look into the history of objective and key results. So if we go back a long, long time, um, Peter Drucker in 54, oh, that's such a long time ago, if you think about it, he came up with something called MBO, Management by Objectives. And maybe some of you have heard about the HP way, because no? the HP way is built on MBOs, Management by Objectives. And essentially the way it works is you have some strong ideas and then it trickles down. And it's fairly strong output oriented. And you know, some organizations were really successful using it, but over time, somehow it didn't. And even in 1990, uh, Peter Drucker himself called it just another tool. Uh, it can be helpful, but normally it's kind of like not really uh, what he was looking for. Now, interestingly, in 68, Andy Groove of Intel, he picked them up. He understood the power of MBOs. However, he made some changes to it and he called them IMBOs for Intel MBOs. And it really helped to make Intel successful. And what he did is he tied those objectives with key results. So basically there was not just, hey, we have a goal, we wanna achieve that. It's like, okay, this is what we wanna achieve. Now let's figure out how we can get there as concrete steps or activities. No, not just conceptual. I mean, conceptual things are easy. You know, conceptual, I probably could solve world hunger. I could probably solve COVID, but how do you make people act accordingly, correctly with what you want to achieve? And this is kind of really the power about bringing in those, 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 those key results. Now, to my understanding, going through some research, the term OKRs was coined by John Durr in his book, uh, in 1990, and he also wrote a book about, about, about OKRs, which I really recommend you to read if you're interested about that. Now, just to reinforce once more, OKRs is not just throwing out some objectives and telling people do it. It's about really giving people, and maybe it's, let's look into the, the comparison here. On the left-hand side, we have MBOs. It's all about the what. I want that. Not that frequently, about once a year. You give people, that's what we want. It's basically in the heads of a few, and then you get, get it thrown at you. It's top down. Often they have been tied to compensations. Now we all know if you tie compensations to some outputs, weird stuff happens. Yeah. Sometimes actually the opposite of what you want to achieve and somewhat risk averse. Now in contrast, if you look to the MBOs, the Intel OKRs, it's what and how. Now, and the how, again, think about in the key results because these are the things we will be doing. And the frequency goes up. It's quarterly or monthly or maybe even both. And that aligns much, much better with the agile mindset we have working in iterations or in Scrum with, with sprints. They are public. Everybody can look at all the OKRs from every department, even individuals. Now, and also he said, he said this book about kind of, uh, and Google is really kind of uh, following up on there. Kind of everybody has their OKRs on their personal website, on, on, their, on their wiki, and everybody knows exactly 
what they're trying to support and how they're going to support that. So the creation of the key results is bottom up. The objectives are being provided from, from the top, but then we as a department to reach that goal from a higher level department or organization will be doing this and this. Or maybe even sideways if there's some interconnectivities. Now I think this bottom up again, this aligns much, much better with an agile mindset. And the sideways, you know, think about you no know, scaled product development with Scrum, uh, Nexus, or maybe some of you with less. There is some interconnectivity between teams working on the same level. Now they can also kind of yeah, do this, we will do this for them in order for them to reach their goal. Uh, they're normally divorced from compensation, which is a good thing. Actually, they go so far as to say, if you read all your objective all the time, they were too low hanging. If you never reach anything of that, they are far too high. So usually the, the rule is there about 80%. Yeah? If you reach 80%, okay. You were, and that's also the, the, the idea about being aggressive and aspirational. Because if they're not aggressive, they don't stretch. Uh, but if they're too aggressive, yeah, you fail. They don't reach even 80%. And you know, kind of what motivates people? Yeah. They get inspired to doing something so aspirational. Now, that's an OKR. It's so simple. You, know, you have an objective. It's basically your statement. And then you have the key results tied to it. Uh, and it's it's fairly easy to actually make a template in PowerPoint or some other tools for that. Let's look at a specific one, a more concrete one. Let's say we want to improve revenue by 10%. No, instead of just throwing it out, okay, that's it. Maybe we could even provide some narrative saying we see some opportunity for this and this and this. But let's say this is our objective we have here right now. Now, Specific key results could be each salesperson makes 50 direct customer calls. That is measurable. Yeah. Or maybe we reach out to top 10 customers we have and ask them if they would, would, would be serving as reference uh, so that we can acquire other customers and bring up our revenue. Or maybe we find out is that so many people there, they go on the website and everything, but that don't click the buy now button. Now, maybe you can think about it. Hey, let's make the buy now button more prominent, more, more easy to I don't know, entice people to click it. Now, the key results, they tend to be smart. Now, we think we all know the smart, smart goals, you know, specific, measurable, attainable, relevant, time bound. Now, the OKR going back to being aspirational and uh, aggressive, they tend to be more like fast goals. That's something I really like to think more in these terms. Uh, some goals should be smart. Some other ones, I believe they should be fast. And it goes back to an article from, from MIT. Just Google fast goals, MIT, and you will find it. The F stands for frequently discussed. So it's not thrown out there once a year. And you look at it and you see, is it still relevant? Is it still important? It's ambitious or aspirational. I think they're not exactly the same words, but for me, they are very very comparable, specific, and transparent. And we all know OKRs are transparent, so it also fits really well together with that. Now, let's go a little bit further and see how this ties back to what we had in the beginning. Because what I often see in organizations is that we want to have clear, valuable goals to work forward. And don't we all like a environment to work in where there's trust and safety? Maybe even throughout the organization, not just the department or the scrum team I'm working in. Now the opposite answer was no goal, no trust or safety. Now clearly we want to operate in the left and uh, the top right quadrant. But often I see is that people you know, I just recently had a workshop uh, at, a, at a company in Austria and they had two days before uh, a workshop about what they want to achieve. And I'll just ask everybody, okay, I'll give you five minutes, write down individually, what is the vision of your organization? What do you want to achieve? What's the next? And I had, every person had something different. There was no alignment, no cohesion. There was no clear, valuable goal. 
Now, essentially, it's kind of like was a a good starting point for me. Is okay. Let's figure out what you really want to achieve. And let's create a valuable goal. Now, trust and safety. Now, think about that. That's where I trust comes to Scrum Master and to the picture, helping to create an environment and over time uh, uh, shift the organizational culture into the right direction. Now, why do I show you that? Because now, if you go back to an OKR. We can say the improved revenue is a clear, valuable goal. And because we have the goal, we can trust that people know what they want to do because it's bottom up. And this allows us to let go, essentially, and let people self-organize, self-manage. Again, all attributes of Scrum. And this is autonomy mastery. Now, maybe some of you have probably seen this video of, of Dan Pink Drive, uh, what motivates knowledge workers. And that's exactly it. And all suddenly it becomes much, much clearer. Okay, this is because the, the objective, that's the purpose we have. So we provide the purpose, which is really important. And then people can figure out how they can achieve that through their key results. And that allows them to work uh, with autonomy and mastery. Now, maybe some of you have also heard about EBM, uh, evidence-based management, something which was developed, we have developed at scrum.org and uh, put also a picture down here from the EBM guide. In the same way, we have a, a scrum guide. There is an evidence-based management guide. And essentially, EBM has four key value areas. So we have unrealized value. That's kind of where we see potential uh, product services where we see like there's a gap. There's some people needing something which isn't there yet. Well, we could fill that by doing this or that. So that's really forward looking into the future, coming up with maybe some really uh, crazy ideas, hypothesis. Then we have current value, which reflects like our current standing. Now, how are we perceived by our customers? Are our customers happy? What's our uh, NPS, uh, NPR score? Uh, how many of our products and features are actually used? Um, maybe also questions like how happy are our employees? I think if you have happy employees, that, that, that's a good thing to have in an organization. Now, those two key value areas, unrealized value and current value, they have a clear focus towards the market. They're more like outward facing. And then we have ability to innovate. Now, how innovative can we be? Essentially, it really boils down to high degrees, but how much money do we have to spend on maintenance? And other repetitive, repeti repetitive, hard word for me to say, sorry about that. Um, things we have to do over and over again. And time to market. Let's say we have a brilliant idea. How long would it take to get this idea into the market to the customers? Now, those two other key value areas, ability to innovate and time to market, they clearly reflect more internal organizational capabilities. And what, what I find interesting here is that, now let's say, again, we want to increase our revenue by 10% or have so many more customers or things like that, bring up the usage index of all features higher so that we find out that kind of, uh, we do less features which are not really that important and so on. Now, in order to get there, usually what we need is we have to improve our organizational capabilities. We have to change those. Or maybe we have to increase our um, degree of automation and take out repetitive tasks, uh, streamline our value stream internally, and then things like that. Now, if you take that idea about evidence-based management and tie it to OKRs, you can say, well, ideas, changes on the key value areas of unrealized value and current value, that are objectives. That's what we want to achieve. Now, the question is not to achieve the objective. What are the things, the key results we have to actually do? And they usually, I wouldn't say in all of the cases, but generally that's the way I think about it. These are the key results. In order to, let's say, make our customers more happy, uh, we found out, we believe we have to deliver more frequently. 
Now, what does this mean with ability to innovate? What key results, what activities would we have to implement there? And as well with time to market, what can we improve there? How can we bring down the, um, the testing time, stabilization time for releases and things like that so that we can deliver more frequently? And once you reach those OKRs, hopefully they will cascade, get together and then fulfill the objective. And hopefully we tied some measurements, you know, talking about evidence-based management. So we would get the evidence through measurements that this actually has happened. Now let's look at a tree, how OKRs could look like. And again, this is really simple in my opinion. Like, you know, usually what, what I see is that objective, you have a bunch of key results you wanna do. And then one of those key results becomes the objective for some lower level department, team, or maybe even individual. And then they translate it for them, bottom up, what can I do to reach that objective? And then maybe it goes further down again. So really, really simple. Now, if someone of you have done up some reading about complexity theory, there's this idea of something we call an enabling constraint. Enabling constraints are things which help us to tackle complex problems uh, by helping us uh, providing some boundaries for us in the way we work. And if you think about in Scrum, short timeframes to show a working product is an enabling constraint because you would see mistakes early on. It will help you to work better. A cross-functional team takes out the silences, makes communication quicker, is an enabling constraint. Now, for me, the enabling constraints, if you look at this OKR tree, is the interconnectivity. Because through that, you can ask anyone, why are you doing that because of that? Why are you doing that because of that? And essentially, all those, those branches throughout this tree here should really point towards the same higher level objective. And this really helps to bring in focus into an organization. Now, in the book I mentioned from John Deere, <clears throat> he talks about Intel. I mean, he was there. And they had a big problem with the 8080 processor. Maybe some of you are old enough to remember the processor. Because at the same time, Motorola had the 68000, which was, in my experience, a better processor. But anyway, now Intel was experiencing threats because they, they discovered that more and more customers, they probably favor the Motorola 68000 processor. So they saw it as a threat. And they came together. and they came up with a new objective. You know, we have to make the AT80 processor the industry standard for a certain category of devices. And then they talked about salespeople, what they can do. They talked to, to, to um, um, marketing and, and, and all of those uh, pre-sales engineers and all of these things. And they came up with their, what they can do as key results. And within less than two weeks, they had basically all of that established and they started acting on it in the moment. Now, there's another kind of the, the end of the story also tells that then the one of the guys who was in charge, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> take a sip of water here. He said, going back to Intel, guys, what you have done there is really impressive. Within the less than two weeks, you hit the ground running. You had a clear marching order, marching direction. You know, it took me longer to get a plane ticket approved to fly to my boss in San Diego to do something about what you're doing, right? And I think if, if a company really starts to think in, in, in clear objectives, bring in the focus, build up those trees, interconnect them correctly, and then see how all of this brain power, hard work basically flows together. <clears throat> and the other thing which is important is it's not just top down. You can even have some things kind of being connected uh, between, between other teams. And again, just going back to what I talked about, you know, having big scale product development where there might be inter-team connectivity. Now let's go back to the, to the onion we had in the beginning. So company vision, business strategy, product vision, and so on. Now, going back to the, the goals we have described in the EBM guide. So there are strategic goals and they are more lofty high up. You know, they are more like here, oh, we see something that would be nice. Maybe think about in the, in the regards also to unrealized value. Then we have intermediate goal. Yeah, this is what we want to do next. And then immediate tactical goals. And you can really see, I think, 
the, the layering of the goals we have here helps you to map strategy into tactics. Uh, what are we really going to do? Essentially up here now, if you think more in concrete things to do, why not have a vision statement as an organization? Based on that, you can derive your business plan. Then you would come up in context of that business plan with a vision for a product or several. I mean, again, that could be a one-to-many relationship. And then you come up with a roadmap. That's what we want to do first. This is what we see next. Then in that context, you would then have your product goal. Based on that product goal, you would have your sprint goals and then your daily goals kind of through the daily scrum and so on. You can really see like how those three things are interconnected by concrete things <clears throat> you could be doing. And now go back and think about this okay, arch we had seen before. So this is how you can nest things together. This is the vision we have. Therefore, we do have this business plan. Would you do this over here? Would you do this over here? No. As key results, bring it further down, bring it further down. And this is how we connect again strategy to concrete tactics. Now, if you think about that, this point, you can then go ahead and just say, okay, now what does this mean for our OKR? Okay, so the, the vision statement of an organization, brilliant objective, isn't that? That's where we want to be in five years. That's opportunities we see. This is how we want to improve the situation of so many people. Now, I grayed out business plan, roadmap, and daily planning, because I think, in my opinion, they are important, but they are more activities we do all the time. So business planning is an activity which leads to visions for certain products. Now, each one of these products would be another, maybe the, it's a key result to the vision statement we want to achieve for the organization. Um, then the product vision, we tie it to a product goal or we tie the product goal to the vision of the product. And then there could be maybe, you know, we have a sequence of product goals. That would be the next one, maybe the next one, once we achieve them. You could, and then for each one of those product goals, we would have a sequence of sprint goals. So you can ask about it. So why do you have that sprint goal? Well, we want to achieve that product goal. So why do you want to achieve this product goal? Yeah, because this product wants to do this and this. And why are you building that product? Well, because as an organization, we want to move in this direction. Now, this has this clear traceability. And you can do this at any place, just randomly pick something and follow all the way up. And again, this is how you bring transparency in an organization and clear focus. Okay. So let me go back here again. So again, this is really, in my opinion, very, very simple, maybe uh, too simplistic. But again, the way I think about it is that I think for an organization to really implement that is not that straightforward because again, it goes maybe deeper than most organizations are really willing willing to go because you really have to bring in the transparency by having clear objectives and you have to start at the top work your way down and as you work you down the people below kind of bring this up and make it transparent again and they are acting and speaking openly about that every time and i know about places where you can go into every department or every people's um, website wiki whatever they have there and you will see this is our objective and these are the things we will be doing for, for the next one month or maybe three months. So, so Patricia, I saw you yes. coming online. Now, hopefully <laughs> there are some questions we have here. Uh, there's, a, there's a lot of questions. And I know I had mentioned at the beginning, um, I think by the nature of the questions and just how, how Ralph was, was progressing that um, maybe, maybe with, his, with his build that we would just let him, um, let him finish his presentation before we bombarded you with questions, my dear friend. Um, okay. So there, there are a lot of questions just in terms of the notion of OKRs. Um, there is a little bit of um, confusion around, um, you know, the link between OKRs and evidence-based management and stuff like that. I think you did a great job explaining 
um, you know, the link between the product goal and how we would think about OKRs. Now for, um, I think one of the first things that, that it might be helpful to discuss is uh, what I've seen out in um, the industry is that there are a lot of people and companies who have decided to use OKRs. Somebody has told them they're using OKRs just like somebody was telling them before that they were going to use Agile. And I think you did a great job explaining about management by objectives and OKRs and basically sometimes how OKRs can be mistaken that it would be management by objectives. And to be honest, it, it easily falls back into that. One of the questions or the comments that came up in the chat was around how they're struggling to use OKRs because it's set up by different organizations. And I wanted to um, see how you might think of this because they have different employee objectives. Um, so they have OKRs linked to each, each business unit. And, um, and they try to link that to the company objectives, but it doesn't work. So OKRs in that way isn't working for them. What what comment might you have there? And I can chime in after. So so the, the question is that there's an organization working with OKRs and they have kind of- uh, Company get, objectives, right? Company so the way that you talked about it like before, yeah. company objectives, each business unit then has their objectives and then they have employee objectives and it's just not, it's just not working. And I'm I'm guessing it's not working in creating a an agile environment. I think this has a lot to do again with, with, with communication and, and lots of communication, if you think about it in complexity theory is again an enabling constraint because it, it gives people the same narrative, the, the idea, why, why are we doing something? And if everybody is on the same page, they tend to make work in lockstep and, and go into that direction. Now, uh, the, for me, the questions would be who creates the objectives for those business units? Are mm -hmm. they being forced up on them? Or they're just saying, oh, no, in the same way we work in, in sprint planning. Hey, this is my goal for that sprint. Hey, developers, can you help me figure out what we need to do to make that happen? And it's not saying, this is my goal, make it. I come back in two weeks. It's like, there's something, let's talk. Mm -hmm. And this is probably my favorite way of saying, you know, this is what we want to achieve in the organization. And we think you as a business unit or units, you are crucial. Now let's talk, let's figure out what you think you could be doing in order to achieve those things. And mm -hmm. that by doing that, you would get, get buy-in because you would provide them the, going back to Dan Pink, you would provide them with the purpose and you just help me figure it out, autonomy and mastery. And by doing that, once people create their own ideas, you are committed. Hey, and that's one of the Scrum values. Like this is kind of like, for me, this is my, my first inclination, how mm. I would think this is probably somebody gave them something, make that happen. Uh, maybe it could be something else as well, but this would be my first inclination. If it yeah. would go in there. I think, I think for me, and this will tie into some other, other questions that have come in, um, and you're getting some very nice compliments about how you're doing a great job, Ralph. I just want to let you know that. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> the, um, the, the, the notion of when we set up objectives and, and obviously, you know, I'm one of the, the co-developers of the evidence-based management framework is that when we think of goals and when you're talking about a top-down, like Ralph is talking about, you know, company objectives, each business unit, everybody, employees, what happens is that you're creating, in my opinion, goals that become siloed and the siloed it further fragments agility, right? So this notion that um, when we think about, you know, breaking down goals into for different silos, that, that's just, that's why I would think it would hardly support an empirical environment that would allow us to, to see if we were meeting um, different objectives. Now objectives, when we're talking about objectives, um, there's this notion of outputs and outcomes. And so I know Ralph put um, a goal, an objective of improve revenue by 10%. Of course, we might think of the impact that we have on the outward, our organization. Um, but I, I, I think of that sometimes as something where we would want to extend that and look at the outcome so that maybe as different units or as an organization, we can start to all cycle towards that one thing. Uh, Rishi Markanday actually made a really nice comment that people... Um, that people don't mention as much when we talk about um, um, OKRs from the John Doerr book. And Ralph, you mentioned the MIT, um, the MIT fast goals, which obviously I love also. Um, but he mentioned CFR, conversations, feedback, and recognitions. 
um, that are important to pair up with OKR. Have you seen organizations do that? Uh, not, not too many because I think CFI is really kind of bringing in the personal aspect uh, into working, working with OKRs. Mm -hmm. um, and I think most companies and, and what you just mentioned, kind of this output focus, and, and that's going back to MBOs. We have an objective and, you know, just, and then you have this trickle down and then people get surprised that, that, uh, not the right things and things are happening. Um, now with the, the CFRs, I think is that if you actually implement scrum, right now, having proper retrospective, having a good scrum master, they are not that important anymore. Assuming assuming you know you really kind of live up to the scrum values you have the proper culture already in place but maybe as a, as a step in between it could be something uh to give it a try i think at least for me the indication is that, that if you have an organization who, which is willing to do that they would show that they are on track to support support to develop the right company culture mm -hmm. Yeah, I think it's that there's so many questions about, you know, moving slowly over to an agile environment. And I think um, one of the ways if an organization is using Scrum is to think about how we can share that information in the, the Scrum events. Um, how would you suggest people share that information and in which events would you think about so, OKRs being shared? Um, so for me, I think, and this is, so good. I'm so glad about the, the new version of the Scrum Guide, which came out in November last year, because now we have a product goal, which is a commitment uh, of, the, of the product backlog. And we have a sprint goal, which is the commitment of the sprint backlog. And uh, now think about it. The vision, and I still believe that even though it's not really mentioned that clearly in the Scrum Guide, there should still be a vision uh, aspirational vision for, for your product you're going to create. And then what's the next stepping stone? And that's a product goal. Now, and uh, thinking back in EBM, vision is strategic, product goal, uh, intermediate. Um, and uh, that could be a key result for the objective we have. And therefore becoming our own objective. And then we think about, okay, what are the things we have to do in order to reach that product goal? Sprint goal one, sprint goal two, sprint goal, the sequence of sprint goals towards that. And this is really how you get this. I usually don't like to use the word blinds, but this is when you get blinds in a good meaning because you really have razor sharp focus on the, this is what we want to achieve. This sprint, that's our objective for that sprint. That's our sprint goal in order to reach that product goal. Mm -hmm. And let's make it measurable because key results, they need to be uh, measurable as we talked about as well. And then if you have the sequence of product goals achieved, you should work towards the vision of the product you have. Mm. Um, and I like, I like how you're talking about that because that denotes the bottom of intelligence, right? So we have a goal and I saw you put the graph there from the EBM course where we talk yeah. about having goals and having them clear and you know, talking about the, the environment that we're in in terms of trust and safety in the team, which, which makes me think about autonomy. Um, one of the things that you, you had, I think, put up in the slides was one of the key results was like, make sure that button's there or something. Mm -hmm. um, and um, a lot of people are asking, when we think about those key results, is it, is it an objective of something that we should be doing or is it um, something that we should be measuring? Can you just go more into how to form those key results? Um, it could be both. So thinking key, so the, the, the first way I think about, about um, key results is for me activities, something we do. Now, some things we do there, you just do them and say done. You know, it's a yes, no, a check mark. But some other things are, I believe are, are more complex. Uh, kind of could be something we need to uh, improve this. And, and then you think about how could we measure that actually? I mean, a yes, no, is easy to measure. Yes, we did it, check, check it off. But the other things that could be more tied to, now also going back to EBM, maybe to some of the, the example measures we have there in place. Now, mm -hmm. when we talk about uh, uh, improve the, we, we think we need to make our customers happy by making more frequent releases. So what can we do on our internal capability side? Uh, let's improve uh, automation by 20%. Now, how can you improve automation by, by 20%? Again, maybe you have to say, well, we have to uh, we have to move into uh, let's say into the cloud and use one of the servers. Uh, and these are the things you can then 
some of them you can just check off and other ones you uh, measure maybe as you work on them for quite some time to, to see how are we improving. Mm -hmm. When I think about the relationship of EBM and OKR, it's, you know, there are both ways of thinking about setting goals. We obviously have the, the four key value areas that we think about something, but it starts to get into good questions about, do you think that that's actually an objective or a key result and a key result to what? And so this notion of outcomes becomes important. Are you measuring it to see that you've been successful and what at least an evidence-based management does is, is, and if you're using OKRs, please consider this of how you can improve them is the consideration of, is what we're doing, this key result, helping us to meet this goal? How do we learn that? And is this objective, this goal still relevant? You know, Ralph, like you brought up, you brought up um, like COVID, how are we gonna do those things? Like though, you know, in the business of what we were doing pre-COVID and post-COVID, are those objectives still relevant? So for instance, when we're talking about improved revenue by 10% or improve automation by 10% or doing those, it'd be interesting to get into. And that's how you start to get better at what you're doing. And it creates less of a, um, a siloed organization. But speaking of siloed, Ralph, um, there's an interesting question about individual OKRs. Do you think as part of a team that there should be individual OKRs? Uh, maybe at the team level, and then um, at it, I'm assuming individual means one person level. I personally, I there's 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 the saying there's no I in team, and I'm I'm sticking to that. So there should be team OKRs or OKR kind of singular in that case. Where what what do we want to achieve as a team as a cohesive unit uh, building product? So uh, the short answer is no, not not on a person, but on a team level. Mm -mm. I'm going to leave that with you because here's the next question. Okay. <laughs> and, and then as I'm asking you questions and you're answering them, more coming. So I'm really glad it's almost like a self panel now. Um, okay. So let's just say, um, you know, somebody's listening to this now and they're like, okay, ours, that sounds really cool. We use Scrum. How would you suggest they get started? You know? Uh. I, I don't think, and I'm, I'm, you know, I'm kind of thinking loud here right now, but I don't think it's so much different to becoming agile to, to, to working with OKRs. I think they, they, are, they really align well with each other. They complement each other. So I think, you know, if you want to become agile as an organization, sure, go for it. And if you want to do it right, maybe think about using OKRs along the way to, to bring in the interconnectivity so that you get traceability about everything. And, and for me, it's like, you know, if you want, want to do something good, why make it slightly better? There's nothing wrong with that. And I, I personally believe OKRs help you with that. Yeah, I think, I think um, and I'm sure this question is going to think about, well, then who comes up with the OKRs? If we want to use it, how do we do it? And how do we write them? And it's, it's the, I think one thing that might be helpful, and especially if you're using Scrum, is to start thinking about that product goal, start thinking about your yeah. goals, right? And so if you're thinking about that goal and you're trying to achieve that goal, whether it's a product goal or something higher, you know, something larger, um, like like Ralph showed in the in the in the onion, um, start to think about that goal, why you're doing it, and what would you have to do to 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 try to achieve that goal. The interesting bit becomes about how big that goal is. So for instance, in evidence-based management, we think of goals in time spans. I'm not thinking about it in silos, I'm thinking about it in time spans. And so with OKRs, what you can do is start to think about how do we break that down a little bit, right? That's what those, those key value areas. And so when people are asking here about time boxes, for me, it was like how, how Ralph put up, you know, there's fast goals, how we might think about it, CFRs, how we think about objectives, OKRs but then smart goals. So the smaller the goal comes, like if we're using a sprint goal, it should probably be smart, right? We're trying to hit this in less than 30 days. Um, so that's, that's a way that we would think about it. Um, I'm just gonna throw this away because I just mentioned product goal, Ralph, and you're the product, yeah. one of the product duos of the book who people love your book. Um, two questions. One, is there an audio version of your product owner book? And second, can you please give an example of a good product goal and a time frame for a product goal? Um, so 
there's a bunch of questions in there. So I don't know that there's an audio version out of our book. So not an official one. Uh, it's been translated now into simplified Chinese, um, uh, Polish, uh, German. So uh, it's, it's really doing well, but I don't know about an audio book yet. Uh, maybe there, there would be something, but I would have to find somebody who can really read well, I guess. Um, then a good product goal. So for me, our time span of a product goal. So personally, that's, 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 that's Ralph's um, thinking about it. Six months plus minus. That's kind of the way I think about it. If it's, and, and for me, because I think the, the, the vision of a product is very, very strategic, but also very high risk. And it's out there. Strategic, full of risk. Now we have our sprint goal, tactical, something we can really commit ourselves to achieve within a sprint. But there was this long stretch in between. And I think we always try to fill it. Uh, and we were using roadmaps and other things to fill that, that, that gap in between. But now we have this term product goal. And, and what I want to say is, yes, that you have, again, for me, six months plus minus. Now, you might have a product goal, which is more strategic, well, longer intervals in between, or maybe some product goals, which are a little bit more tactical, still strategic, but a little bit more tactical because your environment uh, is uh, shifting quicker, things could happen. Well, sure, yeah, you, you may do it in that way. So, and I think this is where um, a good product goal is really helpful. It provides the guidance, the objective for what are we working right now? Why are we spending all the money every sprint? And, um, and I think a good product goal should be measurable. Uh, and actually uh, I created a product goal canvas where I kind of put in there. So basically say, what is the vision we want to achieve? What is the goal we want to achieve? And then the narrative. I strongly believe that for everything we do, we should have a good narrative why we're doing that. What are the things we have observed in the past? Why are we doing that? And what do we believe will change because of that? Now, because I think if people read a narrative, and they understand and they buy it and they're accepted, they will support it. And this is again, how you get internal alignment. So not just throwing out, this is our goal uh, for the product. Let's say in six months, we wanna have that. Give the narrative. Maybe we observed this over the last half year that customers behave like this and that, and therefore we think about doing this and that, and you know, give just people the context, and then bring also in the measurability again. Mm. Uh, we believe we have been successful at our product goal if this goes up, this goes down, and these and these ways. Yeah. Um, and 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 this is kind of the the way uh, I think about about product goals. And uh, uh, usually, what I started to do if if I engage with customers now, and uh, before I go into the first workshop or to the customer, I always ask everybody, write me a one pager with the current situation, what's going on, what is good, what is bad, and what do you think is going on? And just doing this, you know, and people do that, and it's really amazing if you, if I, I maybe get 10, 20 of those one pages and I read through them and I get a really clear picture of what is going on in this organization. Mm. Mm. because it's a narrative. And then I, I read the narrative. I make a conference call with them, maybe half an hour, just a couple of point questions, um, make some annotations. And then I go into the organization and I know sometimes more about what's going on than the boss I'm talking to because he just has his view on things. And I have the broad view because I, have, I, I had the chance to get the narrative about where they are because of that. Okay. So then um, I think these are two good questions and I know this is turning more into a Q and A, but there's, there's like a very, very big backlog of questions, um, which we'll, we'll, we'll take a look at and get back to you um, or Ralph will address them or I'll address them in, in a variety of ways. But what do you think is the difference between, so you talked about managing by objectives, you talked about OKRs and that difference. What is the difference or what is the similarities between OKRs, KPIs, key performance indicators, and strategy. And maybe let's just throw in a fourth thing there, product vision. Okay. I mean, this goes back to Mitch, back to the onion where we had product vision. So that's for me uh, an OKR, an objective, let's put it this way. Um, now, key, KPIs, key performance indicators. For me, I'm not sure for me to have a little bit of a bitter taste because they have been kind of abused in so many 
strange ways. For me, KPIs are nothing else than meaningful measurements. Uh, and that's that's how I think about that. And for me, kind of the KPIs would then be more like tied to the, the key results because they should be more like smart. Uh, these are the things we can measure and see uh, we did it uh, or is this happening? And then it cascades back up to see whether we achieved uh, the objective. Um, and I think there was some other question in there as well. Uh, KPIs. Is KPIs, how is KPIs um, and OKRs, what are their differences and similarities? And also, you know, do you think of that in terms of product vision? Are those kind of, is okay. an OKR, should the objective be the product vision? So for me with KPIs, and again, I, I don't think that they are bad. I just have been abused so heavily in, in the past is that I measure you on that. These are your personal KPIs or your team KPIs. And often, again, KPIs lack narrative. Now, if you provide KPIs with a good narrative, you provide people with an objective, mm -hmm. a purpose. And then they can act on that autonomy mastery going back to, to, to drive them pink. So think about KPIs. Yeah, key results, they should be measurable. So key performance indicators, if you want to call them like that, I probably wouldn't because again, uh, for me, they, they, this, it's a burnt term. Um, but, and I think this is, going back and I'm repeating myself you're gonna I, I'm, a, I'm this broken record here I guess but it's really narrative go back into your organization is there a narrative about why are we are doing something can everybody tell you the story behind that what is the mental connection between all of these things mm -hmm. and this is this is really important and I think again this is lacking in, in key, uh, key performance indicators this is, has been lacking in management by objectives uh, hopefully OKRs if done right, they provide you the narrative. Um, and for me, when I think about it, I think about that question in conversation from value. So why are we doing this? You know, what is the outcome of what we're trying to achieve and the inspiration there? Um, so another more, uh, I think this is a, a simply a tactical question. Um, how do we think about OKRs and scaling and dependencies? Yeah. Now, let's say you have a huge product uh, in a scaled setup. Let's say you have uh, one product owner, five scrum teams working out of that, uh, one product backlog. Now, there is this one objective for the product, uh, the vision of the product you want to achieve. Um, and then let's, let's talk here in the terms of, of, of Nexus. So there's then something where we have the, the Nexus goal, like, we all together as the scrum teams, that's what we want to achieve for this product in the next sprint. And then each individual scrum team would create their sprint goal in the context of reaching the Nexus goal. Now you see how this ties already together. And I think this aligns really well again of thinking in, in OKRs, we have an objective, a vision for our product. Right now, this is our product goal in regards to that product. And therefore we want to achieve this, that sprint, our Nexus goal. And then you as teams could be doing this and this and this. Now, if you think back in terms of Nexus again, we have the Nexus Sprint Backlog. Now, what is the Nexus Sprint Backlog? It makes inter-team dependencies transparent. Now, you can do the same thing. Again, I said that uh, key results are bottom-up, and they can also be horizontal. We do this, our key result is we have to do it kind of first set up the database so that you can uh, deploy something on it. Uh, make this visible, and then we can check it off early on. Mm. Tied to this, tied to the next uh, sprint backlog. Yeah. Um, <laughs> okay. So um, there are so many questions, and I really want to make this, um, you know, not like we're 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 jumping around on different topics. But I promise you, uh, you know, Ralph and I will look at these questions to address them because there's some about balanced scorecard. You know, how many OKR should you be having? Uh, within a team, within an organization. And again, I'm just going to say, think about timing. But Ralph, I think one of the things that we should do as we, we end this um, is to think about, I think what would be helpful is for you to express to the listeners, watchers, um, what, what are some anti-patterns? So the two spectrums, what are some things that will help you make OKR successful while you're using Scrum? 
And what are some anti-patterns that you would um, suggest might exist while using OKR and Scrum? Um, I think OKRs, a good pattern would be, we talk about it. Um, we could get a chance. Now, now going back to this product management onion and when I talked about the vacuum in between like the two layers where there was nothing in there in the beginning. And this is for me, product ownership, bringing it together. And, and in, in there's the English term amalgamation, which means basically you bring two materials together without having an interface in between. And for me, product ownership is the amalgamation from a company vision in, all the way down to people doing the work. Now, from a Scrum perspective, that's why it's so important that the product owner collaborates talks to the developers uh, it's in the refinement or maybe sprint planning and, and some other events that they get the understanding about why is it important what they're doing the narrative but on the other hand as a product owner you should have the chance to understand why the organization is doing something ask questions there get the clear understanding because once you have understood gotten the narrative for the organization why they're doing something you can think and act up on that. And once you can think up on it, you can come up with a product vision, uh, product strategy, could be for a new product, could be a next version of an existing product, and then communicate it down, what I just talked about, to the developers. Now, this would be an environment where I just say, Shh, they will fly, OKRs will fly. They will be really, really powerful. They will be easy to implement. Everybody will buy in. Everybody will, will just do it. Now, for the same reasons why, if this is a hard thing to achieve in an organization, there will also be the same anti-pattern and then for OKRs. Mm. And, and I strongly believe, and I don't want to make anybody uh, bad mouth somebody, but for me, that's the frozen core, uh, the middle management, because they have to become transparent. They have to open up. They have to change in so many ways. And often, you know, and this is past experience, probably from those managers themselves, is that if there's something new is happening and it fails, who gets blamed? It's kind of like, there is some reluctance towards the new things. Mm -hmm. And you might not just be up all flames for it. Yeah, let's do it. It's more like, well, oh, I'll wait it out. Maybe it disappears on its own again. And if enough people wait it out, nothing will happen. And this ties back to company culture. You know, do you have the right culture in place? And for me, agility and agility working with OKRs is all about, do I have the right mindset within an organization? Because if you have the right mindset, you don't have to have discipline to live a healthy lifestyle. You just do it because this is just how you think. This is how you act. This is how you go into restaurants. This is how you shop, how, how, you, how, you, yeah. how you do sports and things like that. And if you have this mindset as an organization, it will just happen and be easy. I think it's a, a big thing about habits. So that's a, that's a, that's a cool thing. So um, thank you for that. Um, for, for some of you who are wondering, because there, obviously Scrum.org has a lot of different resources. Um, I think a few weeks ago or a month ago, if you're, learn, if you're interested in learning about a real life example about how Scrum, the intersection of Scrum, OKRs and evidence-based management, right? So evidence-based management is how do we make decisions about those objectives based on evidence. Um, there was a webinar uh, that, that I actually did with um, another PSC that's called How to Make OKRs Better with Outcomes Over Outputs. So that should, that should address some of the outcome over outputs, how they got started, what were their struggles, just a, a, a case study of that. And, and you'll see that later around EBM. The other thing is, is that uh, there's some blogs out there around using OKRs with Scrum and EBM and, and what does that look like. Um, Ralph is um, definitely going to take a look at all these questions and we'll be looking to answer them um, in another way. Or maybe this means that we just have to do a more focused, a different version of um, another Scrum Pulse around the OKR topic. But thank you so much. Um, uh, the thing that I would like to leave you with today as we go is if you're looking to make OKRs more exciting, more appealing, um, and we're not telling you to use them, but think about them as a learning a learning, a learning, a learning way that might help us develop a mindset or develop some different habits instead of something that gets done to teams and to an organization. So with that, thank you very much. Thank you, Ralph. Thank you, Agile Actors. And thank you everyone for listening today. Scrum on. Take care. Bye. Bye.